We bow down to the Buddha a lot around here because we believe that he's a better person than we are, he knows more than we do. We want to keep that attitude alive. Otherwise, we reduce the Buddha to our own measure, our own ideas of logic and reason. And that closes off a lot of possibilities. As the Buddha himself said, things can be reasonable or logical and not be true. And he never claimed that he could give you a logical proof of nirvana or the Four Noble Truths, or even the principles of mundane right view. that your actions really are yours. In other words, you're the one who decides what to do. It's not some outside force acting through you. And they really do have an impact. Your choices do make a difference. And they're going to depend on the quality of the mind. Now, the Buddha was very upfront about the fact that you couldn't prove these things. You're not going to know them until you've actually taken them as working hypotheses and put them into practice. But it requires conviction, because it, the path asks a lot of you. You're giving up a lot. And so it's good to cultivate that attitude of respect. The Buddha would give a pragmatic proof. He had two kinds of pragmatic proofs. One is, if you do believe in the principle of action, you're bound to act in a better way. You're going to be more careful about what you do. And even if it turned out that that was not true, you could still have a sense of honor in your choices. The same with the Four Noble Truths. Again, they seem very reasonable. I remember when I first learned them, that was the first thing that struck me, was they're very reasonable. But then you look into them more carefully, and there's a lot that can't be proven. Aside from actually putting the path into practice. The Third Noble Truth is especially important. It's because of, there is the possibility of finding an end to suffering by developing dispassion. That we actually would try to have some dispassion for our cravings. And we would adopt those three perceptions. Inconstancy, stress, not self. People will say, well, you can see it all around you. Things are always changing. But do we know that there is nothing that doesn't change? Maybe not in our range of experience, but maybe there's something else out there. And is it really worthwhile saying that these things are not self, that you'd be better off not trying to lay claim to things? When you fabricate a really good state of concentration. What's to tell you that well, this is the best there is, so maintain what you've got? Because there were a lot of teachings in the Buddhist time, and even today, a lot of teachings are saying, well, maintain this state because it's the best you can do. State of good concentration. State of equanimity. But the Buddha says, no, there's something more, and it comes from not fabricating at all. It requires a lot of dispassion, and it requires a lot of value judgments about things that we tend to hold on to very dearly, saying they're not worth holding on to. Even with the path, you hold on to it for a while, but then you're going to have to let go at some point. And if you don't have a lot of respect for the Buddha, you don't have a sense of conviction in that third noble truth, it's going to be hard to let go. So it's good to be frank with yourself about what you know and what you don't know, and what possibilities there are out there. Given that you, there's a lot that you don't know, it's good to look for people who seem to know more than you do, and to cultivate actively that attitude of respect. That's a large part of the motivation, with the right effort. There's a lot of discernment that goes into right effort. You have to know what's skillful, what's unskillful. You have to be convinced that there is such a thing as long-term happiness, and that it can be attained through actions. 
and you really are motivated to work for the long term. There's the discernment there, but also conviction. Remember, it's right view that we're working on. It's not right knowledge. Views are opinions that we hold, and we hold on to them as long as they're useful. We've decided to adopt right view because it seems like the right thing to do. But as long as we're clear about the fact it's seeming at this stage of the practice, as long as you haven't gotten to the point where you know or your, con your conviction is confirmed. When the Buddha talks about gaining the Dharma eye, that's the point where you have verified confidence in the Buddha that what he taught really was true. He really didn't know what he's talking about. When you reach that stage, okay, then you're then you're on firm ground. The image they could give is crossing a river, and as you swim across, and the the river is pretty deep, you could get swept away. But when you finally get to the other shore, and you're not quite on the shore yet, but you get to the point where your feet can reach the bottom, then you know you're not going to get swept away. That's the image for gaining the Dharma eye. Your first glimpse of the deathless. Because that's what confirms that the Buddha didn't know what he's talking about. This is the greatest possible happiness. Because you've seen something that doesn't arise, doesn't fall away. That's not something created. If it were created, then it would end when the conditions changed. At that point, you have an even greater faith in the Buddha a greater sense of his knowledge, because it's not an easy thing to find. Then you realize that you did the practice with his help. He didn't have anybody else. In fact, everybody else at his time was telling him other things, trying to dissuade him. His first teacher said, get into concentration, that's as good as it gets. The five brethren who were supporting him during his period of self-torment we're saying you have to give up on all sensual pleasures. We realized that that was not the case. And so he abandoned the, that self-torture. They abandoned him. You can imagine, there he was. Nobody to support him, nobody to second his, his hunch that this practice, of right, this practice of concentration, getting the mind into jhana, would actually be part of a path that would take him someplace. He was totally on his own at that point. But he was willing to take the gamble, and he won. So as he said, it's, it's a gamble for us too, until we've been confirmed in our confidence. But it's good to cultivate confidence in the meantime. Because, as I said, the path asks a lot of you. It's not an easy path. It's going to ask that you give up a lot of things. A part of the mind has a sense that, yes, giving up on certain things is going to be useful. We've had experience in the past where you've been generous, given up certain ideas, and you've benefited. But that's not proof, but it gives you an inkling. Because there's another part of the mind that says, no, you've got to hold on. Whatever good you've gotten, you've got to hold on. And to fight that part, it helps to have a strong sense of strong sense of faith in the Buddha, and the Dharma, and the Sangha. Faith is often the F word in Western Buddhism, but it's a necessary part of the path. But it's a clear-eyed faith. We know. They're operating on assumptions that we can't confirm yet. But we've got a path. The Buddha says, you follow this path, and, and in following it you will confirm things. And at the very least you can see that it's a noble path that doesn't ask you to do anything that's going to be harmful or shameful. There's nothing grubbing about the path at all. It's a path that speaks to your better nature in every way. That's another reason why we bow down to the Buddha. 
because he found a path that requires us to, to become better people in order to be able to prove whether he taught the truth or taught something else. So at the very least we have a sense that we become better as we follow his path. So approach it with respect. You have a strong sense that this really is special. Years back I was at Yosemite standing on a ridge. There are a lot of photographers. It was one of those spots that on the internet they let you know that if you go to this spot at this time of day, you get a really great shot. And so it was a glacier point with a great view of a half dome at sunset. And then as soon as the sun had set, all the photographers left. And actually that was a period when the light on half dome got really interesting. And there was a photographer standing next to me and he was pointing out different peaks off in the distance, and he said, those are my personal four holy mountains, or four sacred mountains, like the sacred mountains in China. He said, oh, he's hoping to climb them. But then he said, but then of course everything is sacred. And I thought to myself, well no, if everything is sacred, where are you going to go to the bathroom? And everything deserves a certain amount of respect. But some things deserve more respect than others. As you're practicing, you want to have a sense that the path that the Buddha taught is one of those things that deserves your utmost respect. And the person who found it and the people who've carried on the memory of that path, they deserve your utmost respect as well. When you're have that attitude, you're open to learn a lot of things that you would otherwise close off. Because that's the second pragmatic proof. If you believe there is such a thing as nirvana, it opens the possibility that you could actually follow a path there. If you didn't believe it, it would shut it off. Now why shut off that possibility when you don't know? It's wiser to leave the possibility open. Then you can explore it. So see his respect, not as a closed-minded thing. It's the opposite. It opens your mind. It opens your heart. It opens you to the possibility of all kinds of really good things.